So we'll just take another peek at uh, a related period, the Neolithic, which is uh, into the Holocene. Remember we had uh, discussed Paleolithic, Mesolithic and Neolithic, or we called it Middle Stone Age and Late Stone Age. And then we have, of course, the Bronze and Iron Ages before we get into the uh, historic period, the so-called historic period. The prehistoric period is where we don't have documented uh, records of things, uh, so that can go all the way back to a couple of million years. So this book uh, looks at the Neolithic demographic transition and its consequences. I'm just going to take a few figures from different chapters to make some additional points. So we are returning here now a little bit more to how demographic transitions happened and the relations with agricultural origins. So regions of agricultural origin uh, according to archaeological records, so related to the maps we've already seen and we will see some more already. So Central Eastern US, uh, uh, Mesoamerica, South America and so on. So these come with dates, Central Mexico, current uh, geogra geographies and Northern South America here, 5000 to 4000 BP. 4,000 to 3,000 BP in uh, eastern US uh, with potential range of locations and uh, demographic transitions or migrations. So you can see these arrows could have spread in all directions uh, here. Sub-Saharan Africa 5,000 to 4,000 BP. You expect Fertile Crescent to have the oldest evidences so far. Uh, maybe new evidences will emerge elsewhere. So that goes back to 11,000 BP and here these are the approximate limits of prehistoric agriculture deserts mountains etc are not differentiated when these are uh, taken into uh, account to approximate the limits uh, obviously not all regions would have been favorable for agriculture so here is that prehistoric terminology which is basically uh, before about 3200 year BC I think you can check to make sure I have the dates right so obviously diffusion happened in every direction here with approximate limits extending all the way into the Pacific uh, including the Oceania so uh, New Guinea uh, into New Zealand uh, and Madagascar and so on um, uh, India is shown here to be benefiting from the Fertile Crescent. Yangtze River and Yellow River basins go back to 9,000 years, also diffused in different directions. New Guinea Highlands uh, go back to 9,000 to 6,000 BP. So obviously when we have looked at the marine isotope stage climates and Homo diaspora, we have uh, also drawn such arrows and we have discussed mostly uh, refugia, the climate drivers and sea level changes uh, etc. Uh, to say uh, how homo lineages may have been uh, spreading out before uh, the uh, end of Neanderthals and Floresiensis and Devonians and so on. But this is much more into the Holocene uh, Neolithic where uh, Homo sapiens by far were uh, with, in terms of everything we know, Homo sapiens, sapiens were the only remaining Homo species, so obviously that's the only species we are talking about and those settlements uh, came from earlier uh, species migrations and speciations. So we have already said that Holocene was a fairly stable climatic uh, regime. So climate stability and the origin of agriculture from this book again can be seen here uh, in terms of uh, uh, regions and domesticated plants and dates uh, of the oldest remains from the evidences collected. So Levant is again the Fertile Crescent area approximately the same. China, Mesoamerica and Andean Amazonian that we just locked, talked about. Uh, so we talked about Emmer and Einkorn before in terms of how the uh, their properties in terms of holding on to the kernels were changed over time. So those are the two in uh, came out of Levant. Uh, China, so Japonica came out, so this was 10,600 to 10,000 years before present. Rice, uh, 10,000 to 9,000 years before present. Mesoamerica is of course maize center 9,000 years. Uh, 
Kukurbita people, Kukurbita, so 9,000 to 7,000 years before present, 10,000 to 9,000 uh, years before. Um, this obviously adds a little bit more details in terms of specific timings of certain crops, even though we looked at the big table with various timelines of pre-domestication, domestication and so on before. Uh, looking more at four agricultural societies that developed independently again, same, Levant, China, uh, Levant, I'm, I'm not sure if it's pronounced Levant or Levant, um, Mesoamerican and Andean uh, Amazonian, so now we have uh, uh, more crops uh, going back to similar times, wheat, barley, chickpeas, flax, sheep and goats, uh, 9,000 years before present, or China, it's rice, millet, pigs and silkworms by 9,000 years before present. You know, for the longest time, the silk route and the famous uh, silk trading from China, etc. in more recent times. Mesoamerica, corn, bean, squash, turkey by 5,500 years before, before present, and the Amazonian, of course, uh, potatoes, manioc, guinea pig, and llama by 5,500 years before present. The main steps in transition from hunter-gatherer to agricultural societies in terms of the Neolithic demographic transitions and its consequences, which is the title of the book, uh, we have uh, food plants. Uh, so hunter-gatherers were probably already pre-agriculturally consuming wild grains, fruit and tubers as uh, complements to their uh, meat diet. So uh, agricultural societies had domesticated counterparts, uh, animals, many species of wild prey, and then you switch into domesticated species of livestock, chicken, sheep, uh, maybe even cats and dogs. Uh, there are evidences that dog meat was consumed and it is of course still consumed in many places like Korea for example. Clothing, wild animals, vegetables and fibers, so domesticated counterparts exist in agricultural societies. Housing, temporary easy to erect for hunter-gatherers who were not settled into permanent uh, uh, settlements or communities, so here we have switch to more permanent structures in the agricultural society and settlement patterns for hunter-gatherers were small bands and uh, agricultural societies began, into, began growing into villages and towns. Of course, there was demographic transitions also in terms of deciding whether small bands of hunter-gatherers was a better way to organize themselves and uh, to avoid resource limitations and ease of movement following, let's say, the megafauna and so on for food, whereas agricultural societies settled food production, uh, growing villages, populations and towns would require uh, societal structure and culture to evolve as well, governance structures and militarizations and so on, urbanizations, uh, etc., which we talked about. So those uh, demographic transitions also were brought about once agricultural society began to become uh, more and more uh, the way of life, moving away from hunter-gatherers. There are still some tribes hunting and gathering in Amazonia and Africa and so on, but they are a very, very small fraction overall. Just another table, a chronology of plant and animal domestication, points of origin of domesticated species from Jared Diamond with some modifications from Burroughs and Fagan. These are the kind of big names of geographers and anthropologists who uh, have different hypotheses on climate, environmental determinism, impact on agricultural innovation and so on. Whether agricultural innovation driven by climate perturbations comes first or uh, cultural and societal sophistication and complexification come first in terms of agricultural innovations. So these are uh, overlaps with what we have already seen, so I won't read in detail. There is some wind blowing now, rain has stopped in Mumbai, rained almost a meter in a couple of weeks, but now we are in a break period, but the winds have picked up, so hopefully it's not affecting the <coughs> recording too much. So regions, uh, original sites of domestication, uh, of course, uh, starting with Asia, America, uh, China, uh, Africa, India, Fertile Crescent, Sahel, South Asia, East Asia, and so on, and the range of plants we have already talked about, uh, and the range of animals we have already talked about. 
over timelines that uh, we have already talked about here you can see that East Asia and uh, Southwest Asia the Fertile Crescent come up earlier than other regions which is consistent with the other maps we have seen but the timelines are not always perfectly matching and obviously they are somewhat approximate as well but it's very interesting to read these uh, footnotes here squash uh, has one uh, who has two to do uh, yeah corn has two horse turkey uh, horse has three cattle five pigs four right so According to Dilehey, squash was grown in Peru 10,000 years ago, yet these authors point out that wild squash was not found in Peru at that time and must have been imported by humans migrating south through the wild squash habitat. So it, it's, these are conjectures and inf inferences by geographical evidence is used. Uh, the larger seeds might have been carried as a source of nutriment. The question mark against Mesoamerican squash is to indicate the possibility of later local domestication rather than transfer of the agriculture knowledge of early Peruvians to Mesoamerica. So you see that here how the de deductions are being made without being reductionists. Archaeological research by Pope et al. on the Gulf Coast of Tabasco, Mexico indicates the earliest record of maize cultivation occurred along beach ridges and lagoons in lowlands of uh, Grijalva River Delta around 7,000 years ago. Uh, they suggest that Tabasco maize cultivation occurred at least 1,000 years earlier than previous evidence indicates uh, it occurred in highland of Tehuacan and Oaxaca. So you can see how timelines get modified based on new evidences and interpretations. The timing of horse domestication is difficult to estimate since the anatomy of domestic horses does not differ distinctly from that of wild horses. There are still some wild horses in several places, uh, even like Assateague, Chincoteague in the Chesapeake Bay area, where they simply hunted for meat or bread in captivity. There is similar problem with genetic distinctions among early domestic horses since any horses, uh, harnesses would have been made of perishable hide and wood. Uh, archaeological evidence hinges upon multiple skeletal remains of the same year class, young and old, but not in between. If they had been hunted, the bones of horses of all ages would have been mingled uh, and leg bones left behind at the site of the kill. So it isn't clear that it was widely uh, widely consumed as food even though there are places even now maybe like Mongolia where uh, horse meat is consumed. Uh, maybe even in the UK you should check. Ongoing research by Olson and Capo is based on the presence of coral uh, posts in Kazakhstan dated 5600 years ago. Uh, they find that soil with within coral as phosphate and sodium levels typical of horse manure. Many horse bone fragments representative of the entire horse skeletons were also uncovered. Since there was no evidence of farming, the horse was the primary source of protein supplemented by gathered plant material. So we are getting into that area of Central, Eastern, Western uh, Asia where maybe horse was consumed. Uh, couple of more. Pigs were domesticated from the Eurasian wild boar independently in North China and in the Middle East. Asian pigs were introduced from China to Europe in, eight, in the 18th and 19th century, so much later, and hybridization, hybridization, hybridization of the two strains led to modern breeds of pig, which is now a major uh, source of meat for many cultures. Genetics imply that there were three uh, for the fifth one. Genetic, genetics imply that there were three independent domestications of cattle from a single parental type, the auroch, uh, in India, the Fertile Crescent, and Sahel, south of Sahara in Africa. Subsequently, there was genetic mixing. The domestication of auroch may have happened 9,500 years ago, but more likely between 7,500 and 8,000 years ago, or maybe at different times in different locations, so we don't know that. By 7,000 years ago, though, domesticated aurochs uh, were common from the Sahara Sahel to the Middle East. So we'll come back and look at a few more things from the work of Peter Dominical and so on, who has worked extensively on um, Holocene 
climate and cultures and uh, responses of cultures uh, to climate perturbations uh, and so on. Okay, so that's the Neolithic demographic transitions and impacts on uh, settlements, cultures, livelihoods, food choices, and so on. Okay.